Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, Brand and Entertainment. Uh, this section is audience engagement with brands. And this is going to be a segment where we're going to show a couple of case studies. These aren't going to be your typical brand and entertainment case studies. We're going to be delving deep into branded content. You're going to see different ways of using uh, different components of the brand content, different ways of activating the brand with their audience. Uh, we're going to be joined by two excellent uh, presenters with amazing case studies. Uh, it's myself. I'm Paul Cantonis. I'm the VP Group Director of Brand Content at the Third Act at Digitas, and I'm also the Chairman of the International Academy of Web Television. I'm joined by Nick Bailey, who is Executive Creative Director over at AKQA, and James Kirkham, who is the Managing Director over at Holler Digital. So we're going to go through these case studies. Hopefully, you guys have some really good questions that you could start to think about as we go through these. We can also see what you're uh, tweeting. So please feel free to communicate us, with us that way. I'm sure we'll all have our phones out and be trying to reply back while we're up there. Uh, before we begin, uh, there is just one bit, little bit of information that I want to share with everybody about what's going on in the world of brands playing specifically with content. And uh, this is something called the Digital Content New Fronts. This is happening in New York on April 19th, going until May 12th. This is the first year this is happening. And basically what we're seeing is digital content upfronts. Now, they're not called upfronts, they're called new fronts, because we are not playing the television game of creating artificial scarcity with our medium. We know that we have a lot of content, we know that we have a lot of audience, we have engagement that TV doesn't even come close to having, we have limitless opportunities for the brands to create. And so you see starting from April 19th with Hulu, going all the way to May 2nd with YouTube, it is a series of events where everyone is basically presenting their content opportunities to advertisers. To this list, about uh, four other companies have joined in. There's uh, Disney up there, AOL, Hulu, Microsoft, uh, Alloy, NBC Universal, Vivo has joined the list, as well as Google and YouTube. And this is the first time that these organizations are coming together to say, we have the best opportunities for brands. Specifically, native digital content. That's what this focus is on. And so what you're going to see today as well, and why I wanted to show this before we started, is that's what we're going to be focusing on as well, is native digital content opportunities for brands and excuse me, how brands can activate themselves through that content. So we are going to start right now with uh, Nick Bailey. Come on up, Nick. High five. Um, Thank you very much. I am from an agency called AKQA, um, which I'll just introduce briefly to in case you don't know who we are, and you, you more than likely don't. But we, um, we started about 15 years ago as what used to be called a new media agency, uh, then came to be called digital agency. Um, we've never called ourselves any of those things because um, we've recognized that if you try to make predictions in this business, you're, you're doomed to be, to be wrong. So all we've tried to do is lead our clients to new heights through innovation and help them to do that through technology. But while we call ourselves an agency, we've probably got a lot more in common with, um, say, a tech startup or a, um, a technology or product company than maybe we do with, a, with an ad agency. We have a lot of technology experts, um, <coughs> a, lot of, a lot of geeks, working inside the business. Um, Heineken makes beer. And I'm going to talk to you about a brief which they gave us uh, a year or so ago. And as, as creatives, generally, we like really tight, simple, single-minded uh, briefs. This wasn't really one of them. It's a very, very broad brief. And actually, the client came to us with very, very little expectation or preconception about exactly how we were going to make the UEFA Champions League more interesting. They had a, um, a business problem to solve, which is common to many alcohol brands, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We're in France at the moment. France is a dark market, so despite the fact that Heineken sponsor the UEFA Champions League in France, they can't even associate their brand name with the competition. So in France, for example, on perimeter boards around the pitches, it doesn't say Heineken, it says Star Experience. So alcohol brands have a problem in that it's less and less um, easy for them to talk about their product or even their brand values anywhere other than uh, on digital channels, which is why they came to an agency like us. 
But there's a great synergy between the brand and the UEFA Champions League because it's a, it's a social experience. Um, it's the pinnacle of football. So they wanted a way to deepen brand engagement with the competition uh, in a way that wasn't, that wasn't going to kind of mess with, uh, with all that regulatory stuff that they have to deal with. So very, very broad brief. We thought the most sensible thing to do would be to start with a consumer insight. Uh, yeah, and this was it. So this came, wasn't part of the brief, but it actually came out of UEFA's own uh, research. 70% of viewers watch on their own at home, UEFA Champions League. That's not because they're all kind of sad um, loners. They may be geeks. May, some of them may work, work at AKQA. But it's because the games are typically midweek. Um, it's a global competition. Often they're watching out of time zones. So they're watching on their own at home. But football is a social experience. So um, while they may be watching on their own at home, over 80% of the viewers are dual screening. So relatively new expression, but something that we're all starting to talk a lot more about. They're all on their phones, they're on their iPads, they're on their laptops, and they're talking to their friends about what's happening on the pitch, or they're browsing the web, or they're sharing opinion. So those two insights, without any other kind of preconception or direction from the client, are what led to this solution, which we called Heineken Star Player. The UEFA Champions League is watched by over a billion people worldwide, often on their own, at home. We wanted to make their TV experience more like being a fan in the stands, more active, more social, more thrills. This is Heineken Star Player. Star Player gives you skin in every game. Prove your football instincts by responding live to critical match moments. Anticipate and react in real time as the game plays out, just like the teams on the pitch. Stay one step ahead of the action as you create a stake in every shot, corner, free kick or penalty. Dialing up the tension and getting right inside the game. So no matter who's playing, you'll have a reason to celebrate. Star Player is a world first. Exploiting the opportunities of dual screening and connecting viewers with their social network. Either via the Star Player iPhone app or the Facebook platform. Allowing them to create leagues to compete with their friends and the world choosing any fixture to play along live, and, as the countdown begins, get in the game. Running in the background while you watch the match, football experts instantly send alerts for every star player moment, so every corner, free kick and penalty is an opportunity to score. And for those moments when even the greatest match is slow, there's the chance to prove your knowledge with Heineken bonus questions. If your instincts are sharp and you anticipate a goal is coming, Hit the Goal Now button. If they score within 30 seconds, so do you. See how your score compares with your friends at any time in a match. Check how you stack up against the world and earn rewards for a star performance. Finally, once the full-time whistle blows and the scores are in, share the glory and claim your bragging rights on Facebook. Star Player launched on the 26th of April for the first leg of the semi-finals and immediately set the football world alight. Changing the way football is watched forever and delivering a full 90 minutes of brand engagement per player, per game. Star Player kicks off again worldwide in September on multiple platforms for all 125 of next season's UEFA Champions League matches. This is football like never before. This is Heineken star player. So that's star player. How much longer have I got? A couple of minutes. Um, I'll try and squeeze the rest of the, uh, the case study into as short a period of time as possible if the next slide is going to come up. So how do we do it? Um, well, um, the fact that we do behave more like a, a tech startup than a, an ad agency is important when you come to a project like this because there are so many unknown unknowns. So while we, while we already sold the idea to the client, we understood that, you know what, we were excited about this opportunity. We thought that it would work. We had to put it to the test. Uh, we played prototype, pro, paper prototypes for many weeks. Um, we discovered 
that football com contains a surprising amount of nothing. So we soon realised that simply firing out uh, real-time questions around uh, corners, free kicks and penalties wasn't going to be enough. So we created three types of interaction. Interactions that are pushed out by human operators, so judging when moments happen in, in the game, and those moments are pushed out to your phone or your Facebook, Facebook application. Um, uh, questions, so if there was a quiet moment in the, in the match, we can fire out trivia questions. And the third and the most important type of uh, interaction, which was really what made the game super playable, was the user-initiated um, interaction, which is where you decide that you think a goal is imminent. And we actually found that that was the part of the game that people played with the most. So these are things that we developed over the, uh, excuse me, over the course of developing the game. Um, second thing that we learn, and this is the most important thing for probably everyone in this audience or anyone who's thinking about creating a, a, a dual screen application where real time matters, is that live, of course, doesn't necessarily mean live. I'd never heard the word latency before I started working on this project. I soon heard it several times every day, every day, for a number of months. Over the, during this project, we created a, a completely separate project, uh, which was a research initiative in nine markets across multiple TV platforms, measuring the lag of time between an action happening in uh, real time on the pitch and a, and a consumer seeing that on their TV screen, which in some instances, on, say on IPTV, was a lag of up to 20 seconds which obviously would have made the game unplayable. Fortunately, uh, the result of that research uh, project showed that the majority, but more than 90% of players, had a latency uh, experience of less than, than 10 seconds. But this was a really, really important uh, learning process for us. It would have been simple in one market, but Heineken wanted to do this uh, globally. So clearly a huge, huge challenge when, you, when you're trying to do stuff in real time. And I'll show you a really ugly chart next. But just to kind of illustrate the complexity of where we needed to arrive as a horrible Excel spreadsheet. But this is the, uh, the guide that was provided to the human operators who send out the alerts during the matches. Um, it's really hard to see, but there is actually three time horizons within this matrix. And these colours indicate when they're an embargo period, when a high point, when a low point and a medium point uh, time slice happens during a moment in the game and there's, a, the, the, there's three time horizons, so there's when the action's happening on the pitch, when the operator's seeing the action and when the viewer is seeing the action with uh, margins of error of plus or minus three seconds each way. So it became kind of heinously complicated and all us creatives had to become uh, mathematicians but it did our, did our um, left brains no end of good. Um, <clears throat> next important insight was Canadians don't understand football. Uh, they understand lots of other things that I don't understand, but football, um, or soccer as they would call it, isn't one of them. Why was this important? Uh, because the technology that Starplay relied upon, uh, that actually the back end that actually pushed out the messages to the phones, was actually owned and licensed by a company in Canada. And at the beginning of the project, um, we originally proposed to run that part of the project out of Canada and have operators in Canada firing out those questions proved to be uh, impossible, not because they're in the wrong country, but because they had the wrong perception. So that human element was absolutely essential to making Star Player work. So the point here is that technology really matters, but unless the, the human element and the nuance is right, um, then you're going to end up with a poor experience for consumers, which wraps to the final point, I guess, which is enhance don't interrupt. And I think this is absolutely the, the, the most important closing thought for this case study, is that the reason that consumers, that viewers of TV are dual screening is often to avoid the advertising that is on the, on the TV screen that they're watching. They're not doing it because they want to be advertised to, they're doing it because they're trying to escape from what they see as irrelevant messaging. If those messages work together, as the, the, the last speakers pointed out, I think that's great. Uh, but the last thing we want to be doing as brands is pushing unwelcome messages into a space that consumers see as a very, very personal space and a conversation space. So finally, um, it's not over yet, so download the app, pick a match and play. Thank you very much. You're up. Thank you, Nick. Um, 
Excellent. I'm going to try not to just repeat lots of the sentiment Nick's just talked about, because I uh, agree wholeheartedly with most of it. But um, I'm going to try and keep this a little bit different. Ultimately, I'm going to be telling you a little bit um, about Alfred Dunhill, the luxury men's fashion brand. Um, but I want to give that a bit of context and quickly introduce, I guess, us, how we do things, and therefore how we get to work with those guys. So my name's James. I run this company called Holler in London. Uh, much like Nick was describing, we're a creative agency who pride ourselves on talking about engagement rather than advertising. Interruption is really not what we do. Um, instead, solely we get people talking about brands, and these are the kind of brands we work for. Uh, lead agency for Rebel in the UK, work with the likes of Dunhill, as I mentioned. We've been doing this for quite a while, which makes me feel very old, actually. So being a digital uh, agency, I guess, for 11 years, which was way before Facebook and MySpace and YouTube were even actually considered or thought of. And actually, we're best known for our television work, which is probably why the reason I'm standing in front of you today. But we got lots of notoriety for launching television shows in the UK. So, for example, shows like Skins and The Inbetweeners and Phone Jacker. With Skins, for example, at one point, um, well, for starters, we were apparently the first agency to advertise a television programme using social media, which now feels nuts uh, because it's incredibly commonplace and understood. But really, we adopted an old music industry model and created a fan club, um, put on huge amounts of numbers and reach, and we did it in a way by taking content out to where people were, which was vital. We needed to be creating a content experiences sympathetic to the platforms that we were on. So it meant creating really interesting social kind of spaces and turning the marketing of TV shows and beyond into an event in its own right. So people were talking about it before it even came on air. We kind of took this forward from marketing TV shows to being a part of the TV experience and the kind of two screen aspect that Nick was talking about there. We created a, a component for a reality television show called Chatnav, which actually harnessed all of your comment and opinion and then played it back at the people in the reality show. And it meant the people in the show were physically looking at their screens and their devices and deciding what they should do next based on the comments that we were all making as viewers. And it's quite a powerful thing when you think about it. And it meant that people were tweeting weird stuff like this. It's weird bitching about people on seven days whilst watching people on seven days, talking about people bitching on Twitter. So we created this bizarre world where people are kind of eating themselves up. Now, what I wanted to mention is why this is a less important context is from a TV and entertainment kind of background and foundation, we do an awful lot of work for brands, but we try and adopt almost televisual and entertainment style approaches for them. So Innocent Drink, some of you may know, very big in the UK. They were one of the first brands to adopt this kind of very humble human tone. And we were really trying to appeal to a, a kind of, well, the marketing director called them posh mums. Uh, so it's a kind of a certain age bracket of uh, women who are kind of the core consumers. And what we did was, again, try and adopt these entertainment strategies to hit them regularly, but in ways that are relevant. So we always appeared in their news stream. It evolved things like games and content experiences and stuff to get them excited and create a love for the brand again. Orange juice had become a commodity like milk, but we wanted to remind people how much they loved it. So we made lots of lovely, engaging promotions that were more akin to entertainment, actually, than traditional brand work. One of my favourite pieces which we created was a campaign called Tweet and Eat, which is amazingly simple, whereby to raise awareness for one of the products, the more you tweeted, the cheaper it would be to actually eat. So by owning the time at lunch times between 12 and 1, we're all thinking about our food, we got people to tweet lots and lots, and therefore the physical price of the product would reduce. They could go in store and buy it even cheaper. And that kind of adoption of social is a kind of, in an entertaining, fun way is kind of important and key. And this year, it's mostly, I think, vital that we consider how all of these behaviours that we've learned through the likes of Facebook are now merging and blurring with the real world and much more so we'll be making a click, uh, having an interaction and expecting a real-time response in the real world. And this is all leading, I think, to a second stage of two screen, whereby you know, you've got writers and directors sticking Twitter bombs in their shows, so they write a really incendiary piece of writing um, within the uh, broadcast in the first opening two minutes with the sole purpose to get people to switch over because of the reactions they're seeing on Twitter at the same time, which is a, a crazy way, really, to begin writing your TV shows. We're working with Revlon, the cosmetics brand, who are part of a Britain's Next Top Model tie-up. And what we're doing with those guys is understanding that most of the women, the million or so women watching the broadcast, are pretty much online at the same time. Like Nick mentions, they're all dual screening. 
but we want to own only that 60 minutes and make their time there and appointment to view online. So on the Revlon's Facebook page, during the broadcast of the show, for only that 60 minute window, we're gonna be doing offers and promotions only to our Facebook audience. And it creates a habit, it makes a behavioral change, which is kind of important. Most of this leads you on to what Facebook are changing. They've, they've altered so much in the last two weeks because they're intentionally going head to head with telly. They're trying to get brands to become exactly like your friends. They've even stopped referring it as advertising and they're calling it stories instead. And so for some brands, this is an unbelievably big opportunity where ideas are everything. And the way you promote those ideas, much like the wonderful Heineken app you've just saw, is through apps or is through games or is through competitions. The way you wrap it up is kind of vital. And that's because they're trying to go head to head with telly. They want the direct comparisons between impressions of TV and Facebook. But of course, online you get much more. You can like, you can see how many are talking about it, how many people are sharing. So the brands who are just chasing that like metric are kind of going to be reappraising where they're at. So to kind of finish off, I want to quickly mention um, what we're doing with Dunhill and that kind of sets the scene of why I think this is particularly interesting. Dunhill are a luxury brand. They're a luxury men's brand with uh, fashion where some coats are like 30,000 pounds. So it's a hugely kind of uh, interesting model to think, why would you even be playing in the realms of social media? You know, luxury uh, historically has been something that you're trying to attain, but potentially never quite reach. And I think Burberry have really blazed a trail, but Dunhill are trying to do something quite different. For one, we're working with them to really generate this sh sheer purpose. It isn't just a, an ad hoc accompanying brand uh, page or campaign. It's trying to get this whole idea of intelligence and elegance and success. And if you want to go and interact with Dunhill, you can kind of be a better man, frankly. And they're trying to do it in a way that is getting rid of the old advertising approach. They're doing it through branded entertainment. It's, of course, what you all have been hearing lots about and why we're all here. But they need stories to tell their message. One of the campaigns they did use British Olympians, past, present and hopefully future, to kind of genuinely inspire people, take content, take it out to people and excite them. And what we did was grow an army of fans around this content so we can get them excited by it, share it with one another and hopefully then engage and appraise the brand differently. So we adopted an approach like we do with when we work with the likes of Red Bull, where we premiered it on a social platform, first of all. We did live Q&As with the talent. We even housed them all in a wonderful members club in London. And so we generated lots of interest and noise and reach and basically gave it the, co the content, the publicity that it deserves, which previously it didn't. It kind of sat there hoping, whereas we were able to get people genuinely talking about it. Their recent fashion show in Shanghai named Trafalgar, again, rather than just let it go and be talked about, we took the content, wrapped an interesting kind of SoundCloud rip-off timeline over the top of it, added a layer so that people there can add their thoughts and messages and a sentiment to the show and it acts like a time capsule or a legacy. So you go on, you see this amazing runway experience, but also as you're going through it, you can see people's comments like, wow, that bit gave me goosebumps or the music here is incredible. And so you start to get a feeling of what it was like to be there, which is again what you know this kind of online can afford us. So what I'm going to show you now for a couple of minutes is their final, um, or my final piece to show you is a trailer for their new uh, film. Um, it's about a jockey. And this is the beautiful thing with Dunhill, that ultimately they're just trying to create interesting films that, um, that are appropriate to the audience who are keen and interested in Dunhill. It isn't intrusive. If you want to go and look at it, great. It's almost the opposite of going on YouTube and seeing a dog on a skateboard for one minute. It's actually, do you know what? Sit back, enjoy it and be inspired. So this film um, hopefully gets that across. Got to be patient. <laughs> Cheltenham Gold Cup is the ultimate test, the ultimate arena. You've got McCoy and Walsh, the best riders over a fence that have ever lived. And there was Sam Welly Cohen as a completely full-time amateur. By full-time amateur, I mean he's got a full-time job 
and he has a hobby on the side, which is taking part in the most challenging races in the world. the first amateur for 30 years to win the Cheltenham Gold Cup. It's that sort of something that you don't really dare dream of. It took a lot of courage from Dad to put me on the horse. I'm joined by Robert Whaley Cohen. No more race goes saying put a proper jockey on it now. If they have that problem, then they are very sad. The reigning Cheltenham Gold Cup holder, 5-4 favourite. The money is pouring on long run. You're not necessarily the underdog anymore you're the one to beat. Where you're not good enough, it's very stark. And Cordo Star is still the king! Once you start not winning a couple of races, it's all your fault. A slightly anxious moment for Sam Whaley Cohen. And everyone says, oh, you ought to replace him. I think it would be a lie to say that it doesn't affect you. Long run under pressure. It's about defending your right to ride the horse. Never went into racing to get into that sort of politics. Porto Star is turning the screw. If Sam wasn't as talented as he is, then I wouldn't do it. As far as I'm concerned, it's Sam's ride. We're doing it together. Sam has got something on his plate. No amateur in the history of the sport has ever won the Gold Cup twice, let alone back to back. Not fulfilling potential is the worst crime there is. If they do it again, they become not just racing immortality, but whole sporting immortality. You could be at the start of something extraordinary. It's kind of goggles down, focus and enjoy it, because this is one of the most special moments of your life. And if you can't enjoy the way out, there's a good chance you won't enjoy the way back. Um, something like that is so, if, so exciting for someone like me because, um, you know, you've got Just So Films who made an incredible piece of film there and that's just a trailer and the whole piece is only about 10, 15 minutes long it's going to be and it's going to be released in the next month or so. But Dunhill, as a brand, acting in such a different and interesting way. And so for an agency like us who've kind of grown up and born out of the entertainment world and the ability to, I guess, create notoriety around TV shows, working that way with brands, the whole thing becomes quite an elegant mess, quite an interesting blurred mix of that world, part TV, part branded entertainment, part content, part marketing. And I think that's especially exciting. <clears throat> cool. All right. And what I'm going to be presenting is a case study for the launch of the Samsung Galaxy S2. This is something that happened back in last October. Uh, Samsung has been particularly trying to go after Apple in a very strong and aggressive way. And so this is going to kind of give you a little bit of insight how they came out of the gate going after Apple in a way that they thought would really um, start to stand out and, and differentiate themselves. So um, let's, uh, let's get this started. Get me up there on the screen. Hold on. You have it? Yeah. Great. All right. So, they needed to demonstrate the power of Samsung Galaxy S2 as a mobile entertainment platform. Brands love to talk about themselves. Brands love to tell you how wonderful they are. And we love, as, as consumers, to completely ignore them most of the time. So what we needed to do was get out there with this messaging, but not do it from Samsung's point of view, especially if they were going after Apple. So what we looked at was a complete solution in which we had lots of different components coming together, from different types of partnerships, PR, uh, messaging, content, cross-platform. These are all the little pieces that you're going to start to see. But one piece right at the the top of it that to me was the most critical was this piece of content that we started to create. And in particular, we decided to work with a very influential YouTuber named Freddie Wong. We decided to go the route of instead of making it ourselves and doing brand entertainment in which we create and originate everything from the brand, we said, why don't we work with somebody who actually has an audience, actually has an audience that would really care what he has to say and work with them in a really genuine and authentic kind of way. 
And so that's why we decided to target Freddie. He's the fifth most subscribed director. Um, we use clout a lot. You guys may also use peer index or cred. So we looked at his clout score and knew that he was highly influential. Uh, I think he's got a total of uh, yeah, three, a little over three million subscribers on YouTube. Again, we know he had a built-in audience. We know that he would be the right kind of person to work with. And what we decided to do was tell him, OK, we want you to help get this message out about the Samsung phone. What would you create? What's the thing you've always wanted to make that your fans would really appreciate? Mind you, he makes really great gaming and uh, effects videos, very entertaining videos he makes. And what we want to do is get out there that not only is it's a great platform for watching content, but also creating content. And that specifically the camera was a really good camera. So the campaign that he came up with, or the idea that he came up with, was called Gamer Commute, in which he would take you know, make this video in which he pays homage to a variety of games from the, from the present and the past. So we're going to see the clip of this. Uh, and while you're watching it, think about what games you actually recognize. I think there's a total of 15 games that are actually within the video. The other thing to think about is half this video was shot using the Galaxy S2, and the other half of it was shot using a really high-end, nice camera, and the footage is intermixed. So see if you can also tell which came from which. We also had a behind the scenes, which gives the, the, gives the answer away later. But let's, uh, let's, let's take a look and see what it looks like. Oh, wait, sorry. One more thing. <laughs> uh, we also knew that the night before we were going to launch this video, he was going to be on a top talk show within the US called Jimmy Kimmel. So we knew that there was a few things happening all at the same time and that we would come out with a bang. So, Concept came together, video came together, he goes on Jimmy Kimmel, he announces his channel, and this is what then goes out there to the world. The important thing to see is at the top, it says special thanks to Samsung for getting, uh, giving us Galaxy S2 phones for filming in 1080p full HD. In the description of the video, he talks about half the video was shot with it. In case you want to know some of the scenes, when he's on top of the car shooting, when he first gets out on top of the car, that's actually shot with the Samsung, as well as uh, when he does the Frogger scene which is actually two scenes composited on top of each other. He, there weren't really cars when he first did it. He just ran across, and then they composited the cars on top of it. Those were actually shot with the phone as well. So the quality was really good, um, and it came through in that video. We then saw the numbers, and this is where we really got blown away. We did not, to be very clear, we did not spend any money on the launch of this video. There were no paid views involved. This was purely organic views. 
at the start of this campaign. And it, within those first 30 days in particular, there was about nine and a half million views on this video from his audience, which was above and beyond what he normally would get. Being on the TV show the night before obviously helped out a little bit. We were estimating he was gonna do about three to four million views on it on YouTube uh, specifically. We released the video. It's another important thing. We released it on his YouTube channel. So Samsung didn't feel the need, or we convinced them basically, not to take the video and only put it on samsungmobile.com or put it on their YouTube channel. Samsung Mobile playlisted it on their YouTube channel, but it was actually his video. And so his audience was, were, uh, was able to get that video, watch that video the way they normally would, and then there was the Samsung messaging in it. It was also released on his Facebook. It was also tweeted out by him as well. And as you can see from the numbers, we had a really, really, really great response. And in the month of September, when it first came out, it was Samsung's number one viral video, uh, Ad Age's number one viral video. It also was number one in video and entertainment video during the launch. You can see that it started getting all these accolades all within the YouTube platform. And that was very important to us because we wanted it to be a genuine audience, not just a manufactured audience through paid media. Here's the most important part, the comments. They were about 27,000 comments alone under the video that were just about the Galaxy S2. And you'll see there's a variety of different types of comments in here, but most of them were incredibly um, inspiring for, the, for Samsung. They were incredibly happy. People were saying, this is great. My God, it looks so good. I want one. How can I get one? Can I get your extra phones that you got? So this is what we wanted. We wanted people talking about the Galaxy S2. Without the people talking about it, there really was no point in, in Samsung doing this and trying to tell everyone how great the phone was. This is what we wanted. We wanted people to actually be talking about the phone came up in the press as well, again, more with AdAge. Uh, and in fact, this was the piece that really got us the best. In the epic smartphone battle, Samsung nudges Apple out of first place. And this was the start of Samsung in the mobile phone market outpacing Apple for the first time and saying that we are a true contender to the Apple iPhone. And the, the, what this also preceded was the newest campaign that Samsung is doing, which it directly pokes fun of Apple iPhone customers waiting online for the new product when everyone has these amazing Samsung products and they're all excited about and they want that instead of waiting for the iPhone. Other things that we did with it was uh, after the 30 days, we then went ahead and did a masthead on YouTube. We then did some ads. We actually had originally were going to do paid media to support the video. When it started to do so well, we took away that paid media and put it towards more uh, generic display ads that then drove to um, other, other platforms that we had. So we did do a very strong paid media side of it. We then got him to curate some apps and we did this with a bunch of different celebrities as well. So it wasn't just the content that he made. We then got him to say, these are the apps that I really like. And he gave her a quote about uh, the YouTube app on Android on the Galaxy S2, which is really good for cat videos, just utterly fantastic. Very meaningful quote he gave us. But nonetheless, it did, it did work. Um, we also then did another activation where we had an app predictor where you would pick which apps you like, and it would tell you which apps you might like depending who you were friends with, which apps you should get as well. We started to do that, as well as we created these custom cases. And Freddie created the custom case that's on the upper right-hand side. We also worked with some other YouTube talent like Toby Turner, um, Danny Boom, and you, I forget who the one on the lower left is. But we did a bunch of different types of um, uh, activations here as well as well as the, the way the conversations were happening. The, the measurement during this time was share of voice rose by 7%, acquiring 5% from Apple. So we weren't just driving the market, we were actually taking away from Apple, which was really our core goal here. Lots of users, lots of likes, lots of activity around the brand. Lastly, the way we were able to do something like this was we had a very key partnership with a group called The Collective. And I think it's important when we get up here and do case studies to really talk about the different components that came together. So you had the ad agency, you had Starcom, which had the media dollars, you had um, a, a social agency called Deep Focus, 
that was part of the mix that was doing the app predictor component and the cool cases that you could win by participating in the app predictor. You had us, Digitas, doing driving the creative digital strategy and the content. And then you had the collective, which is a YouTube talent agency and, and management company that was providing the talent. So they were providing the influencers um, from which we were then pulling from and getting them to engage with this audience and to engage with this content. So that's how the whole thing came together. Thank you. So uh, one of you had um, said while you're up there, I think we got a few minutes that we can talk a little bit and then we can do some questions. One of you had talked about, I, th I think it was you, James, talking about brands and the like and the idea of being, and Facebook being stuck, almost this idea of stuck at the like. What role do you see content, original content from the brand, or co-created content or curating content play in getting a brand to go beyond this idea of I just want likes on Facebook? Um, I think Facebook themselves are forcing the hand in, in that front. I mean, they've made such bold changes in the last few weeks. They're making it very clear that it is going to be beyond the like. Um, Let's be honest, there's a commercial reason for that. They're going to go head for head against telly. They want to quite literally get people to compare the amount of money you spend on a TV ad versus the amount of money you might want to spend with Facebook because they know full well the statistics show people are, A, probably having more propensity to spend more time with Facebook anyway, B, it's cheaper to advertise, and C, beyond that, they've got all of the additional kind of metrics. So they're saying there's so much depth of engagement. The conviction and the, 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 the thing I guess agencies might, might myself are having to do is spending time with brands and get them to reevaluate because likes been the one thing they've kind of had. And do you know what? For two brand managers or marketing directors over a beer going, how many likes have you got? It's a kind of easy common denominator. And we have to start making them as complicated as it is, say there's a little bit more to it than that actually and there's a bit more depth. And I think when they get art, start to understand that, then. They're kind of delighted because it shows a huge amount. How many people are physically talking about it at that minute? You know, that's a much more interesting metric for starters. What do you think, Nick? Well, I, I, the whole light thing, it's, the, the whole light thing is one of the reasons I have a, actually have a problem with the term social media. Um, I think there are social networks, mm -hmm. and I think there's word of mouth, and I think there's earned media. But um, the fact that the clients have, have kind of conflated the idea of a media space and media reach with the idea of likes has become a problem both with the way they've briefed in agencies and the kind of work that they've got because they've just been looking at numbers of fans. And even if they've known the fact that edge rank um, means that many of your fans don't actually see your posts, they've, got, they've kind of pushed that to the back of their mind so that they can have the, the pub conversation and say, oh yeah, well I've got 10 million fans and you've got three. I think it's all about depth and treating uh, Facebook as a conversation space and actually um, prioritizing your communications based on the types of people who are engaging in that space and the way they're engaging. We've done a lot of successful work, our London office has with Nike, um, using um, third party um, partners like Sprinkler to mm -hmm. identify smaller groups of consumers, to engage with them on a really, really deep level, to release uh, exclusive content to them. Um, on a planned basis strategically and actually build a much more active, engaged community around the brand, which is genuinely having a conversation and engaging around the, uh, the brand rather than just clicking once and forgetting about it forever. Got it. With regards to content and a brand, at what point does a brand decide they should originate content or co-create content or do both? How does that factor in the conversation? Um, I guess my answer would revolve around the work we do with Red Bull. Um, so Red Bull, I guess, are probably one of the best exponents of, of branded entertainment and branded content. But in a way, much of it, I think, you know, they openly admit they kind of fell by accident. Um, on one side, they create these kind of incredible experiences that people go to, uh, actual live events. And the can of drink is almost peripheral. It's almost kind of like the merchandise of the thing. But you actually go and take out this amazing emotional kind of response and go, Jesus Christ, they're doing these amazing kind of acts that you talk about, that resonate, that get shared. So they're the things that they stage, that they physically get you to. And then agencies like us give them publicity and kind of get people talking about them. On the flip side, they also then co-create stuff. They will physically walk into a broadcaster uh, with a few billion brand dollars 
and say, we've got an idea and should we do something together? Where, where you kind of decide to choose those lines, it must be down to the value of the brand and what you can actually get to people and, you know, probably the worth of the product or the idea behind it, you know, because ultimately, much like as many people in this room will experience, if you're going in to pitch an idea, it's got to be pretty interesting. It's got to be something engaging. There's got to be something worthwhile behind it. Does that matter if it's something the brand should originate and you're saying this should come for the brand's voice? Yeah. Or is it something they should co-create with your talent or your, or your already existing content brand? I think the co-creation part is vital because, yeah, I think you might be saying it yourself earlier, it lends its that authenticity and legitimacy to the whole piece, absolutely. But, in, but you know, you're going to need a brand voice. It just might be like in a Dunhill case, a brand, brand voice might be more surprising. You didn't realise that they were behind a piece of film like I've just shown there, for example. And, and I think that surprise is kind of nice because it might arrest public perceptions that you already you might have about the brand. Right. So Nick, this was all Heineken. Heineken is all over the Champions League. It's all over this content that, that's being created. Is there any conversation, should Heineken partner up with somebody who's already got a voice in that space? And do they do that as part of this? And actually create content. Mm -hmm. um, well, they, they have done that with uh, rugby, not with football. And I think it's, um, it depends on the association. And it, it, it depends on the space that the brands are playing in and the audience that they're talking to. There's a lot of depends there. But I, I don't think there are some brands that should do content and some brands that shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I think any brand can earn the right to do content, you know, you've only got to look at someone like Axe, you know, FMCG, they've kind of, or, or Pot Noodle, mm -hmm. who yeah. moved from a space where you kind of think, well, we're at Pot Noodle, they're not going to make films, to, you know, creating really quite funny, sharp, viral, shareable content. I think if you create um, a, a value for yourself in the space that your consumers are playing in, um, you're prepared to take risks um, and you partner up if necessary with the right people. I think any brand has, the, has kind of the right to create content. They kind of can own Fosters, don't they? And Fosters are a great example of that, where they noted that pub conversations and kind of catchphrase comedy was so actually crucial to the audience they wanted to go after. Subsequently, certainly in the UK, they then went after of creating a raft of comedic kind of content and branded entertainment based around comedy. Did they have the right? A few years ago, maybe not, but now it's absolutely fine. It feels synonymous. Well, what I think is exciting, actually, is that the idea that there's a kind of hierarchy of um, value of production um, in not just in broadcast but in content is generally is kind of falling away I don't think the yeah. new generations of consumers coming through really care mm. um, if a brand created content or if a TV production company created content <laughs> or if a filmmaker or even a consumer themselves they really just look at the content and, and um, evaluate it that, that sure. way uh, we do have time for two questions if anyone does have those questions uh, wow. oh. Angela up in the front Hold on, we have a microphone coming. Oh, this is Angela and a TV that with the MIT blog. Um, you had mentioned earlier that AKQA prefers not to predict, which makes sense. It's pragmatic and it keeps you from looking salesy or talking jargon. But how do you incentivize clients to say yes to an idea that incorporates <laughs> technologies they've never tried, maybe never even seen before? What kinds of outcomes do you tell them they can look forward to? I, I think part of it's all about integration and it's, but it's integration both within the agency and also with other agencies as well. So, you know, we work with other agencies all the time, whether they're media agencies or above-the-line agencies like Wyden and Kennedy. But um, we don't sort of look at trends and say, oh, well, you, this year you should definitely do a, um, um, an Android app. You know, we, we, because we have technologists involved early in the process, we're able to identify opportunities within briefs. So a great example of that would be, it's an old piece of work now, but say Fiat EcoDrive, where Fiat briefed us to tell, tell the story of how um, um, economical their vehicles were. Our technologists were working in the, the Fiat factory, talking to the technicians, and they identified the fact that there was this data feed coming out of the car, and they said, hey, you know what? We could actually create an application that analyzes the way that you drive and encourages you to drive more efficiently. So because technologists, I mean, they, because the geeks are there at the front end of the process, not just being asked to execute stuff after the, the planners and the creatives have had their hands on the brief, that's how we work to innovate. I don't think there's a sort of special formula to it. I think it's just a question of having people who understand technology and innovation at the right point in the process. 
We have time for one more question. Let's see. Okay, so let's end on one thing. We each got about 20 seconds. Uh, if you are somebody who has an idea and you think, boy, it would be great to get a brand involved in it. A lot of people are talking about how do I reach brands or how do I get my idea out there. You've seen some good ideas and you've probably seen some bad ideas being pitched. What's something that you wish everybody who was pitching an idea realized before they went in or knew before they went in? Um, probably for me, the age old thing of not just assuming people are going to see it. And that's really learned from broadcast and doing cross-platform stuff. But it was a kind of a bugbear of certainly commissioning editors and people I work with, and it's the same for brands. It's you don't start the point of, and we're going to put it there where people will be. It's, it's just not the case. You have to have a baked-in thought about how this is going to be enriched by people actually being there, by having a ready-made audience. So also talking about ready-made audience and distribution. Yeah, absolutely. Right, OK. It, it's kind of a possibly a re-articulation of the same point, but I would say don't think about the brand, don't think about technology, but think about the human being that's going to be consuming that and ask yourself the question, why would they care? And I think it's a question that all of us in this industry actually too easily forget to ask frequently enough. And you know that's why we end up with stuff that you know, doesn't have an impact. And it's all about making an impact on, on people and moving people, not about creating technology, not about creating content, but moving human beings, make them, making them create, creating an emotional connection with your brand. So that content is the most important thing there. It has to be true and, and good. And, and I think an insight about what your audience is looking for is the most important thing. Got it. OK, great. Well, uh, thank you very much. We are going to be at the Meet the Speakers outside to the right-hand side. Thank you, James. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you.